I'm really excited to introduce someone who has a massive passion for Vietnam, about sharing her love for this country, the beautiful people, and the amazing history and culture, and sharing it especially with foreigners. Welcome to season 11 of a Vietnam podcast with me, your host, Neil Mackay. I came to Vietnam in 2015 for a vacation, absolutely fell in love with the place, came back in 2016 for what was really going to be six weeks, and then we were going to leave and go back home after some travels, and now, eight years later, I'm still here. I started this podcast in 2019 to share stories of people connected to Vietnam, including my own. And in today's episode, I'm really excited to introduce someone who has a massive passion for Vietnam because it's her country. She was born in the Mekong Delta, which if you don't know, is a few hours south of Saigon. And she has worked in the Vietnamese tourism industry for nine years. She is super passionate about sharing her love for this country, the beautiful people, and the amazing history and culture, and sharing it especially with foreigners. And she also is super passionate about helping local charities that need her help. So we're going to be talking today in this episode about all of that amazing stuff. I'm so excited to introduce my guest today, Tao Nguyen. Thank you for joining us on a Vietnam podcast. Thank you, Neil. I have been working in tourism for around uh, nine years. Uh, as you say, like I was born in Mekong Delta. It's just like a little town uh, where it's very peaceful and very beautiful place. But I moved to Saigon for studying in the business administration. And then I started working in tourism in the third year of university until now. So already around nine years. So when you went to study business administration, what was your initial plan? What did you want to be when you grew up and when you finished university? So like uh, my uh, mom has a small business in Mekong Delta and she wants the children to study in the business as well. So I studied business administration because of her. But finally, I found business uh, administration. What I study is very fascinating. And very interesting. I learned lots of things like about marketing, about uh, like customers, um, expectations in school as well. And I apply it in their work. And also, I really like to talk with the people. At the third year of university, I uh, worked in tourism and I found it's very interesting that I can have a chance to talk with lots of foreigners. And I understand different people with different personalities, different cultures. And it's had, I had a chance to introduce Vietnamese culture to them. I really love uh, doing that. That's awesome. And it, so actually, I'm completely wrong because you have used your degree in, bus in business administration, right? Because you have your own tourism company and everything you probably learn in university is helping you now. <laughs> that time, I worked for another company. Uh, I did an open company. Uh, yet, so I uh, I still work in tourism, like in different departments, and then I decided to open the company because I wanted to give like the real local cultures about Vietnam to foreigners, and also I want to bring the best, but uh, the real genuine uh, taste of Vietnam to foreigners. So I decided to open the company. I want to know what was it like growing up in the Mekong Delta? Because one of the things I talked about recently with someone who's probably about the same age as you, a little bit younger, he's 24, talking about, and I talk about it all the time, the rapid development of Vietnam. It's changed so much so quickly to the point where his parents are dragon fruit farmers and only just retired to now he lives in the big bustling city. And that's a normal scenario for so many young Vietnamese that their parents were farmers living off the land. And then all of a sudden they're working in office buildings and they have like amazing jobs. That's a really quick transition. Like in my country, it has happened as well. So my grandpa was born 1929 and I was talking with him recently about his upbringing because I didn't really know about it. And he was brought up in absolute poverty. He shared the bathroom with 40 people. Uh, he used newspaper to wipe his bum, you know, like really, really uh, horrible, horrible conditions in the inner city. 
So that was only two generations ago. So I'm only two generations away from, you know, poverty and, and horrible circumstances. And I feel like Vietnam right now is just one generation away from their parents living off the land. So what did your mum do and what was life like living in the Mekong Delta growing up? <laughs> yeah, it's a very uh, good question. My mom uh, was born in Mekong Delta and she has uh, like a small garden from her grandmother and um but she 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 didn't study much she didn't study university but i got impressed because of her uh, talent because of her creativity and sometimes i feel like she got all of the business tactics from somewhere uh, i study in university so when you studied in university, you were like, my mom did this and she didn't study anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's like, uh, I learned a lot from my mom and she uh, spent a through lots of difficulties in her life, obstacles. And she told me that you need it to spend time on those things to roll. Yeah. So it's like the life's going to teach you the lessons through the obstacles. So you need to face it and don't avoid it. So uh, you need to put yourself out there and uh, challenge yourself to roll. So my mom told me the lessons like that. I feel very lucky to have my parents because they're very open-minded. Yeah, even they uh, live in a small town, but the lessons they told me got very um, modern and very very good to me. So I apply a lot and I learn a lot from them. And what did your parents want you to do after university? Yeah, it's a good question. After you don't, <laughs> after university, my parents wanted me to go back to Mekong Delta to work with them. <laughs> they say uh, they can pay a lot for me to work with them. And then I say, uh, you told me that <laughs> I needed to challenge myself and to spend more time uh, for experiences. Like this now for time. Like it's, it's not a time for me to ch challenge myself. Give me some more time. Say okay. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I ask is because we I've talked about this just recently when I recorded an episode with Tan, and it's obviously come up many many times before by comedians all around the world, by Vietnamese people, Asian people. There's a stereotype that's 100% true that all Asian parents want their children to do what? Doctor, lawyer, engineer, any other jobs that they want you to do? So that's why I ask, what did they want you to do when you finished, finished university? Like other uh, families in other countries, and the parents want the best for their children. So they want to be close to their children and they want to take care of their children. Vietnamese. Parents are very protective and they want to be uh, close to their children so they can help them in case they can. And it's just like um, the teachers, if the, the parents are teachers, they want their children to become teachers, of course. And also, of course, for doctors, but like for entrepreneurs, they're very open-minded. So they are open for their children to do whatever they want. So my parents are uh, open, are very open for the children to do whatever they like to do. That's amazing. That's so cool. So your parents, have they been on one of your tours before? Parents doesn't uh, like to travel much to <laughs> other places. So they just want to stay in Mekong Delta to visit the temples or to visit the markets. Yeah, they don't want they to don't travel. They don't come to Saigon much. They don't want to travel much. <laughs> So where did you get that passion then for tourism and for sharing everything that Vietnam has to offer? Because like, um, before when I worked for other companies and I feel like when the travelers told me the stories about their experiences in other places, they, I feel that they didn't feel very happy with the experiences uh, because it's just like a tour and they finish the tour. It's just like a one way. Yeah. And I wanted to um, 
do something different, more connections. So like I decided to do this and my most passions about doing this is like to connect the travelers like friends or like families so they have real connections to Vietnam and when they come back to their country they can, can tell the stories about their uh, experiences to their children, to their friends and their children and friends can come back to Vietnam. What do you think makes Vietnam so special, so attractive? Like, how do you share that passion? Because as I mentioned right at the beginning, I fell in love with Vietnam almost as soon as we got here. We went back home. I've told this story before. We went back home to New Zealand and immediately we're eating Vietnamese food, drinking Vietnamese coffee. We're so excited to come back. And I know so many expats, so many foreigners. I've been here eight years now. I know so many people that have been here 10, 12 years, longer obviously come fall in love with the place. I know people who've come, lived for a while, gone back, they miss it. Some people leave and come back. What do you think it is about Saigon and Vietnam that attracts people to come and visit and to stay here long term? I feel like you love Vietnam a lot after living here for eight years. And uh, there's some things about Vietnam and that makes Vietnam very different from uh, their countries or the other places. I think the best part is about the people. The people here, they're very kind. Even they don't have much money, but they can help other people. So the lottery ticket sellers can give money to homeless. Yeah, even lottery ticket sellers are not very rich. They don't have much money. But if the homeless come to them, they are willing to give money to homeless people. So the kindness is something uh, is uh, something that attracts the travelers. They want to come back to Vietnam. So I, I say, I repeat myself a lot because I don't have that much to say. But one thing I do repeat a lot is I feel like it's such a stereotype and I really hate that when people say things like, oh, the people are so kind, they're so nice. Not not people from Vietnam because you know better than anyone, but I mean people overseas. And I don't just mean about Vietnam. Like the tourism slogan for Thailand is like, Thailand smiles better, I think. And I find it quite condescending when people will be like, oh, the people are so lovely when all they've stayed is in a five-star resort in Thailand on the beach. And you're like, yeah, of course the people were lovely because you're paying $500 a night for a really nice hotel. But I do actually think the Vietnamese people are amazing. And I hate saying that because I do find it condescending and stereotypical. But they really, really are lovely. And the reason that this came to me even more just recently, like obviously I know this, but it, sometimes it comes to me like examples. So we just did the fireworks on the waterfront last week for National Day. And I'm terrible at judging crowd sizes, but there must have been tens of thousands of people, maybe 100, 150,000 people on Winway Walking Street and on the waterfront. And I posted a video on YouTube of it and someone said, how did it make you feel? And that question made me think about it. And I thought, do you know what? The biggest thing, I felt safe and I felt happy. There was no, no aggravation. And I feel like in the, in the West, in my country anyway, generally people are happy, but I feel like there's always an air of violence could happen at any second. You never know if somebody's going to throw a bottle. Like I've seen people be violent in Australia. I lived there for four years. And I constantly felt a sense of violence was going to happen at any moment because Australian men can be at times quite violent. There's some problems there. But in Vietnam, the people are so lovely. They are so nice. And it doesn't matter where you meet them, if they're a lottery ticket seller or they're a guard that makes, you know, 50 cents an hour or whoever you meet, they are just the nicest people. I've heard that that's because of the kind of Buddhist background, religion, Confucianism, is that true? Or why do you think the Vietnamese people are so lovely? I love your stories. Yeah, I love your story, the way you share. You share the story. Why Vietnamese people are so lovely? Because we have like the Buddhism background and also we believe in karma. So what we do now cause the consequences in the future. So we try to do our best. We try to live in the moment and we try to help others. When we believe after today, tomorrow is going to be something happens from today. 
I think it's so hard for foreigners to understand that because that's a mentality you're brought up with. And do you know what that explains perfectly? Why there's no road rage in Vietnam. Now, I'll be, I'll be honest, sometimes I get angry here because someone does something so stupid on the road and you're just like, fuck. Ah. But generally, like the traffic here is just insane. But people don't get angry about it. And that's what we've learned over the years. It is because of Buddhism, because people aren't going to get angry at you. Yeah, the traffic is, is like a thing. It's very crazy, to be honest. Like, uh, there are lots of traffic on the streets, but they're very calm. The people here are so relaxed. <laughs> and even they smile at you when you bump into them. I mean, I found myself doing that now as well. I think even on the way here, or yesterday, last night it was, me and this guy kind of both went to go to the same space. And instead of getting angry, you just smile at each other and he like lets you go through. And so I don't get angry very often, but sometimes I, sometimes I do get angry. Because uh, they are very positive and they think when they pump in, into you or you pump into them, this is like uh, not because your fault or because of their fault. Just because uh, some other reasons it happened. So they, they just think it very positively and they react that very positive. It's amazing. Apart from the people, what else do you think attracts people to Vietnam? Like you obviously go on, you take people on tours. What is it about those tours that excites people? Other things that make travelers love Vietnam is uh, the their real connections and the genuine personalities of the people. The people here, they are quite uh, spontaneous and very genuine. They don't fake it. They don't act. So what happens, they're going to tell it to you. Or if they don't like it, they just tell it to you. And they don't really think it's going to cause any problems to, uh, to you. So how do you incorporate that into your tools what makes your tools different to just what you said, like the one-way tools? Our tools are the focus on the uh, two-way connections. So we usually uh, give the, the information about the food or places through our stories. So for example, I want to talk to you about the traditions of Vietnam through my stories, through our tour guide stories, not from the book. The book, you can read it. Articles, you can read it. But other stories are not on the articles. So it's better to understand other stories. And then you can know about Vietnamese traditions. And we encourage the travelers can tell what they want to, to say. So for example, to, in the conversations, usually about 50-50%. Um, like we talk. And then travelers also talk. It's like friends or families. So during the tours, we can know each other culture and we can learn from each other. So it's, it's better in the future for you and for us. What you just said there brings me perfectly to my next question, which I've been really, really excited to ask. And we've talked a little bit about stereotypes. You've dealt with so many foreigners, but tell me about what have you learned about the different types of foreigners? How do you stereotype them? How, what are the Germans like versus the Indians versus the Australians versus the British? When the British even break down into Scottish, Welsh, Irish and English, what is your opinion of all those different types of foreigners? All foreigners are really lovely. I is Vietnamese. I think all Vietnamese and foreigners are very lovely. But? But? <laughs> <laughs> different countries have different cultures, different people have different uh, personalities and different personalities come from different circumstances, from their past. So we need to understand and um, like, uh, empathize with uh, uh, what they are, who they are and their reactions. Like uh, Americans are very straightforward, they're very generous. Are they the best tipples? They're not the best people. <laughs> <laughs> no one is the best. <laughs> My parents are the best. <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, Aussies are very uh, generous as well. They're very open-minded. Swear a lot. 
they're very rare. They, they're very uh, easy going, so yeah, they yeah. can very, uh, very, very natural and very spontaneous. British are a little bit uh, different from Americans and Aussies. They are quite strict about their information. So they want a lot of history. They really love history. And uh, also the culture, the coffee things, and a lot of information. Sometimes a little bit strict. See, I'm trying to get you to basically talk shit about all the different nationalities because the reason I ask as well is we had a conversation one time with a dentist and he literally was explaining to us that different countries have different ways that they treat their teeth. He's like, I, like Indians have one way, the Aussies, the British, he's like, they all have different. You can tell the stereotype of a culture by just looking at their teeth. And I'm sure as a tour guide and someone who's on the front face of tourism, you're being far too nice. I'm sure you see way more than that. Yeah. Play, uh, <laughs> the different, different uh, countries have different things to tell. But lay like, uh, for us, the Indian travelers are very strict. Yeah, they require a lot of rules and with different expectations. So for us as a tour guide, we cannot complain anything. We need to make everything good by listening to them and understanding them and um, make it best for, for us. We need to make it best. We cannot complain anything. <laughs> You're too nice. You're not going to say anything bad about anyone. That's fine. No. So tell me a little bit about uh, some of the things that you do on your tools here in Saigon. What do you do to get that two-way connection and to show somebody, to show people something a bit different? Mm, we have different tools, like the tools uh, about food, like food detour, food lovers. Uh, we focus on the local food uh, in the hidden gems where are non-tourist destinations. Take tourists to the non-tourist destinations so they become tourist destinations as well. That's one of my favorite things. I have somebody I know and it pisses me off so much when we go somewhere, like a tourist place, and he's like, oh, there's so many tourists here. And it's like, you're one of them. We are all tourists here in the same place. You can't complain about the other tourists coming to the tourist place. So, but good job. Do you take them to the non-tourist places? And what happens when they become touristy? Then you have to find like another place that's even more, like we're going to go 10 miles out of Saigon to get some Kum Tam because this place doesn't have any tourists. <laughs> Saigon is still very local comparing to other places. So there are lots of local places. In Hanoi, it's quite hard to find local places, but people can find it. But in Saigon, Saigon, we can find lots of local places where are non-tourists, food stores. So if the tourists come to the place and it becomes touristy, you can buy another place. <laughs> there is a lot of places to go. A lot of can, places, yeah. lots of options, so no worries. For sure. And then tell me about your charity work, because I know you're super passionate about helping other people, and that comes from your parents, as you kind of mentioned, and I know you've told me that before when we've hung out. What charity work do you do and how do you help people? Like um, for myself, when I grew up, I feel very lucky that I have uh, like parents and I have everything because the parents gave me the best education. And also uh, there are lots of people around who are very nice, very kind to us, like you or like Adria. 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 <laughs> who get it right? Don't worry, Adria. And uh, for myself, I think I need to give it back to the community and uh, helping a little bit about um, Vietnamese community. Like we want to improve locals' English through the English clubs. So we have created the English club where the young people, also the old people can come and talk with the foreigners. This is like a chat. They can gain the passion about speaking English again. Because the Vietnamese education in public schools, I, when I studied, it was quite boring. And we study a lot in books. Myself, I think uh, speaking directly with foreigners is very interesting. And they're going to like it. And they're going to love English. 
and English is very important for their future. If they speak English fluently, they can uh, study abroad or they can teach their children about English. They can communicate with foreigners and they become open-minded. So there are lots of opportunities for them if they can speak English fluently. It's about the English um, speaking in Vietnam. Other activities as well we did. We have the unrevealed village people. I think this is like uh, sometimes helping people is like about helping ourselves as well. Because if there are unrevealed people, we can feel we are good people. Sometimes helping people, we need to thank them because we feel good. Because people say, oh, you're very kind. But without them, how can we become kind? So sometimes helping them is the way for us to say thank you for giving us a chance to help them. And together we're going to have the better lives. That's beautifully put. I love that. It's interesting you say that because it just came up on my Facebook memories that yesterday or two days ago, I found somebody's phone on the street uh, and then I'm, I was able to get their number or they called and they spoke in Vietnamese, but I gave it to a Vietnamese person and they translated. I gave them it back, long story short, and I felt really good about myself because I'd done like a nice thing. Like, you know, some people could just keep the phone to themselves. I was like, no, no, of course I'm going to try and get that back to somebody. And then talking about karma as well, the next night I was at a networking event and they pulled my business card out and I won one night stay at the presidential suite in the Sofitel, which I know that's not the same thing, but I was like, oh, that's a little bit of instant karma. Like I did something nice and immediately I got something nice back. But what I want to ask about is something that I talk about a lot and people overseas, tourism, tourists especially, they have this opinion that Vietnam is a third world country. Like I've literally seen that written down. They think that Vietnam is a really, really poor country. Um, and I, being living here for so long, especially in Saigon, I see a completely different side of it. And in fact, even by definition, I think Vietnam is a middle income country. So the, the people like we just talked about, your parents have gone from working in the Mekong Delta to, you now live in the big city and that, that change is happening fast. And we, right now we're in Tao Dinh, which is, it is one of the wealthier neighborhoods, but you're going to see really nice cars going about. So there are obviously people that need help. There's inequality. Now, the people that you see in Saigon and in Vietnam that do have the money, that drive the Ferraris, the Lamborghinis, are they giving back to help other people or have they just become so rich so quickly that they don't care? And you're smiling, so I'm interested to know what you're going to say. Yeah. I love the way you share and it gives me lots of ideas about the stories I'm going to tell you. Mm -mm. The rich people, they do lots of charities. Some of the rich people and they help a lot who didn't say what they did. I think the most success, successful people are the ones who help the most and give the most without telling people what they did. Yeah. So it's like there are lots of rich people in Vietnam, like who help for the, the patients in hospital for the surgeries, or they have charities organizations as well, like uh, lots of uh, famous actors, Models did lots of charities activities in Vietnam and billionaires as well who give it back to their community. So do you see Vietnam as a poor country still, as a, a third world country? And what, what kind of things do you hear from foreigners, from the tourists that come? Are they surprised? Because I don't know if you've heard of the concept called poverty porn. And I know my accent makes that really difficult. P-O-R-N, porn. Uh, poverty porn, where people love, like, you know, one of the things, so I've, I've worked at my previous job is working with underprivileged children. And I know that there are some orphanages that you can organize to go on a tour of the orphanage and you get to hold the kids. And 
I'm really torn about that because I think that people have a good intentions and it's nice to be able to hold a child. But at the same time, you're not doing anything really to help that child long term. You know, if you really want to help a child, you should adopt it or you should be involved in their life. But at the same time, if that child who's in an orphanage and never gets any human attention gets human attention even for a short time, is that a good thing? It's really difficult. And a lot of Westerners, especially, kind of love that poverty porn because then they don't suffer from that. So they get to be like, oh, look at us giving money. And I'm sure I'm part of that as well. Um, what do you see from tourists that come here? Do, they, do you think they enjoy seeing poor people and being able to help them? Or are they surprised when they come and they see like a Lamborghini drive down the street? Um, it depends on the nationalities as well. Like uh, Americans or Europeans really love to interact with locals. But so, um, some other countries in Asia, like Singapore, uh, like um, Philippines, or like uh, Koreans, they really like the pictures in the landmarks and in the main attractions. They like more pictures. For Europeans or Americans, they like to interact with the locals. So. But the tours didn't have much opportunities, like didn't have many opportunities to join the charities in Saigon. So far, we did lots of charities with locals and expats. So the expats have more opportunities to join into the charities in Saigon. And uh, I just say like some places, do the charity tour to give the opportunities for tourists to uh, give it back and to help the community. I did thought about that, but I thought it again. I think charities need to be genuine and spontaneous. And uh, the people who need the help, they can feel it, they can think it's really good for them. It's not for marketing, it's not for promotions. And I want it happens to the people who need the help. And I think that's part of what I'm saying. The problem is if you're offering a tool to the orphanage, it's not. It's you're very sensitive. Yeah, it's hard. And so another example I just thought of is, well, we were in India recently this year. Uh, we were in... Mumbai and they have a tour of one of the famous slums so it's like I can't remember the name of it right now but it's near the inner city and it's where all the poor people live and Adri Adri was like was like um do you want to go on the tour because they literally do bus tours that will take you through the slum areas and I was like no like I don't want to go I mean she agrees as well she was just checking what my opinion was and I was like no I don't want to go and see poor people like that's horrible like I don't want to be a tourist that's like hey let's look out the window at the the poor people in the slums and um it's difficult to see that so I don't know how much it happens here in Saigon but I do know I've heard of the orphanage tools are going to visit an orphanage and again the people doing it are probably coming from such a good place but take a step back and think like, am I actually doing anything good here by just showing up in an orphanage and holding a child? Like it makes me feel good, but is it good for the child? Yeah, that's right. It needs to be uh, good for the child instead of just the, the images, pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some people, they just want to help baby take pictures and post on Facebook. A little bit selfish, I think. Because a child wants to feel the real feelings not the pictures. Yeah, imagine those people are the children, how they feel. Yeah, they don't like it. Well, I'm going to finish on a joke because I'll bring it back to being a bit lighthearted. One of the jokes I used to tell when I did stand-up comedian, I've not done stand-up comedy in a while. But again, a lot of my comedy, you're trying to think about real life. So the joke goes along the lines of, it because you see people, right, and you probably have this in Vietnam as well, right? Uh, sorry, in Saigon, when you're doing your tours, they want to haggle, right? And they're like, yeah, it's 50,000 dong for a t-shirt. And they're like, no, no, I'll give you 30,000 dong, right? And they've seen this before. Like, they want it to be cheaper. And then I'm like, if you translate that into your own money in your own country, you're trying to bring the price down by one pound. A pound? You're trying to take a pound away from this person's pocket because it feels good. And then this person will go home and they'll be watching the television and it will come on the TV. 
you can sponsor a child for just one pound a day in Vietnam. And they're going to be like, oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, we got to sponsor a child. It's only one pound a day. When they could have just spent that money when they were here in the first place. <laughs> a little bit. Well, Tao, thank you so, so much for coming on a Vietnam podcast. Tell people listening, where can they book your tour and why should they book it? Whether they live in Vietnam or whether they're listening for, from overseas. Yeah. For all the tours are, I think, I believe, lots of uh, good companies who do the tours in Vietnam or other countries. But if you want to find something, uh, very real, genuine connections uh, about Vietnam, I think our tours are for you. And what's the name of your tour company? The tour company is Viet Awesome. <laughs> Viet Awesome. So make sure you check out the Viet Awesome Tour Company. We'll put the link in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for coming on season 11 of a Vietnam podcast. Most of all, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And I cannot believe I forgot to say this at the beginning, but this week we just found out that this podcast that you're listening to right now, a Vietnam podcast, has just been awarded the best interview podcast in all of Asia. So that is just incredible. Thank you to everybody that listens, everyone that's been part of it, everyone that comes on as a guest. And then personally, I also found out that I was awarded the best audio producer in Asia for the work that I do, not just on this podcast, but all, all the clients that we work for across the world. So thank you to everybody who trusts me and my team to make their podcasts and share their stories. Uh, it's an incredible feeling and to be awarded by the radio days is just incredible. And last thanks as well to Dolphy Cafe. We're in Taudin right now and they reached out to me last week and they said, hey, we got a cool spot. Do you want to come and record? a podcast there. So we are recording from the Dolphy coffee shop and hence why we are drinking coffee as well. So thank you very much for tuning in. Make sure to follow, subscribe, turn on notifications, do all of that good stuff. And the best thing that you can do is share this podcast with somebody else who loves Vietnam so that they can listen too. And don't forget, if you want to join our community, go to patreon.com forward slash a Vietnam podcast. You can join for free or for as little as a dollar a month. We're creating a community on there of people who love Vietnam who want to talk about it, who want to do more, who want to join us on, on events and maybe one day be a guest on a Vietnam podcast. Tao, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Cheers.